Hello, my name is Stanley Philippe and welcome to the FPA Virtual Lounge uh, PAPM edition. It is Wednesday, uh, November 25th at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. You know, as the page liaison at Carleton University, I have a, a special kind of place in my heart uh, for the Public Affairs and Policy Management Program because a lot of the pages that attend Carleton University end up choosing this program uh, as their degree of choice. And, and I can see why, you know, there's a real connection, a real synergy be, be behind or between, uh, you know, studying policy and, and working on Parliament Hill. So uh, hopefully you have your eye towards um, all the amazing opportunities the nation's capital has to offer and all the amazing opportunities this specific program has to offer too. So you're going to hear from uh, two amazing folks that, that have a, a pretty cool story, both have stories to tell uh, about public affairs and policy management at Carleton, but we also want to hear from you. Uh, so please, uh, if you can, uh, during uh, today's event, uh, ask us some questions. Use the live event Q&A to send us your questions and we'll do our very best to answer those questions live uh, during uh, this evening's event. Okay, I don't like to talk too much because then I'll end up talking for way too long. So I'm going to bring someone here who has uh, a really great perspective on this particular program. Uh, she is a program director of public affairs and policy management. Her name is Lisa Mills. And again, she's got a lot of really cool things to say. So uh, Lisa, uh, the mic and the screen is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Stanley. Uh, it's really great to be here. And thank you to everybody who is here today. And if you've got any questions for me, feel, please feel free to ask. Uh, so as Stanley said, I'm the director of the PAPM program, and I also teach a first year class called the Policy Cycle. And what the Policy Cycle class does is it looks at public policy. Um, now, many of you tuning in right now will probably have a pretty good idea of public what public policy is, but a simple definition for today is that it's the things that governments choose to do or choose not to do. Uh, and this is a really, I mean, all time is important for public policy, but the time that we're living in right now is extremely important uh, because COVID has really highlighted the importance of decisions made by governments and, uh, you know, what governments decide to do or not to do in relation to the pandemic um, can make a big difference to how many people live or die or, or get ill from, from the, the disease. Um, so what the policy cycle does is we focus on current public policy issues. So, for example, some of the things that we're talking about in the class this year um, are the controversy about the WE charity. Now, I think the WE charity is something that um, many of you will have had connections with before. And uh, what we were concerned about and wanted to talk about in the class was not just the controversy itself, but kind of the broader issue of what role do charities play in our society? What role do charities that operate in a continent such as Africa, um, charities from rich countries when they operate in poor countries, what kind of issues does that raise? Uh, so there's questions there about, well, um, how much of a role should charities actually play in society, um, when charities um, are involved in society, um, what does that mean for what the government's role is or should be? Um, how much space uh, should there be for, for charities in relation to government, for example? And um, we've had quite a few guest speakers in, in the class and in that week's discussion we had Faroz Manji, uh, who is someone who has been involved in development work for many, many years uh, and who has also been featured as a speaker in uh, programs like Democracy Now, for example. Uh, so he spoke and was really interesting to hear about this issue. Um, another issue that we're looking at is uh, related to the rise and importance of Black Lives Matter and the issue of state violence and anti-Black racism. 
and uh, tomorrow that class is going to examine those issues and we have two organizers from a community advocacy group in Ottawa called Black Hub and they are going to be talking about the issues of dealing with um, police violence in Ottawa and dealing with the issues around defunding the police um, in the municipality of Ottawa and the kind of budget discussions that have been going on between the Police Services Board and uh, the municipal government and community organizers in this city. So again, I think that will be um, pretty interesting for students. Um, next week, we're going, the class is going to be talking about issues of public health, uh, particularly in Toronto. And the guest speaker for next week is going to be a graduate of our program, um, Garima Telwa Kapoor, and she now works for an organization that works on public policy issues. And that organization is called the Maytree Foundation. So what we try to do in the course is to talk about public policy issues that are current and that are relevant to your interests, um, but also to give you a bit of an introduction to the technical and the um, the theoretical aspects of public policy as well. Uh, so the course is called the policy cycle. And uh, what that means is that we um, talk about the various stages of policy so that the beginning stage is where governments and policymakers think about, OK, how do we understand the problem that we need to address here? What are our goals for addressing the problem? Then the next stage is implementation, which is how do we actually um, how do we put this program into action? How do we make it work? And evaluation is looking at how do we assess the program? So we look at the all three stages and we look at policies from a number of different perspectives. So we think about um, what's the kind of conventional perspectives of relating to public policy. We also look at um, gender based analysis, which looks at um, the different ways that policies might affect men and women and non binary people um, and how people might also be affected by policies um, according to class, uh, ethnicity, age. Obviously, age is a pretty important issue in relation to COVID. Uh, so we, we look at different perspectives on policy and try to relate those to what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, so in terms of um, advice for transitioning from high school to your first year at university, what I would really suggest in your first year is to make use of um, the teaching assistants and your professors. So teaching assistants and professors have office hours uh, once a week at least, but once a week uh, for your particular class. And um, for a lot of the semester, we often end up kind of sitting in office hours waiting for somebody to contact us and it doesn't happen. And then when an essay is due or the exam is, you know, in a couple of days time, we will get lots of panicked requests for meetings and we will meet with people. But it is much better for you if you kind of go to office hours as soon as you can and say, you know, can you give me some advice with this assignment? Here's how I'm thinking of this assignment. Um, what do you, yeah, how would you uh, advise me to approach this? So I would definitely advise that. Um, at Carlton, we have something called the Centre for Student Academic Success that runs workshops on all kinds of things from time management to writing to reading academic articles. I could really strongly recommend that you use that. And there's also something at Carlton called Peer Assisted Study Sessions. Um, so as a PAPM student, you would be uh, usually doing economics and peer assisted study sessions can really help you with your classes. And that's another big advantage of coming to Carlton. Um, I'm just going to say before I hand it over to our uh, student ambassador uh, that the other thing I would really recommend about coming to PAPM in particular is that 
our program is a small program with fantastic students. Our students tend to be really engaged, um, really smart and really concerned about what's going on in the world and want to make a difference to it in some way. Um, and because it's a small program, you get to know your cohort and you get to have friends within your cohort. And uh, I think that's the best thing I can say about our program. Um, we also have a really fantastic program administrator uh, and the program administrator is there specifically for PAPM students. So in other programs, um, they're too big to have a program specific administrator who are going to actually spend a lot of time with students in the program. Um, but PAPM, this is one of the big advantages that is you've got somebody who's there to support you and advise you and help you navigate your degree. And the other great thing is that there are all kinds of opportunities for being in Ottawa. Um, so there's opportunities to do co-op, there's opportunities to um, spend time with a policy organisation in Ottawa through something called Kruger Policy Connect. Uh, but I will leave it there for now and I'm going to hand it over uh, to Courtney Campbell. Uh, she is a fab Faculty of Public Affairs Ambassador and a student in the PAPM program. And she is in the International Relations Specialization. Uh, she is very interested in issues related to global health and uh, she's a really terrific person and a great student. Um, so Courtney will also speak to you a little bit about uh, her experience in the program. Thank you so much, Lisa, for handing it over to me. Um, I'm so happy that you all are here today and I can share how much I care about this program and how much it means to me. Um, like Lisa said, I am in the International Relations and Conflict uh, Specialization of PAPA, and I'm in my third year. Um, I care a lot about global health and feminist foreign policy. Um, that's great if you have your research interests developed, but along the way you'll develop them. Um, I came into university not completely knowing what I wanted to specialize in, and that's okay. Um, your administrators who you reach out to, your, your professors can really be a great source of guidance. And there's so many benefits to being in the PAPM program as well. So for example, um, really taking advantage of being within the national capital, or the nation's capital, sorry me. So for example, um, I was lucky enough to secure a job on the Hill in which I would walk in through the House of Commons every single day and get to meet some of the MPs that inspire me a lot. Um, I was able to take advantage of a program called Model Senate that began last year that is opening again this year if you're interested. Um, there is so much to do. I'm also definitely very involved in extracurriculars on campus. There's such a welcoming presence and especially within the Papham community. For example, some of my peers recently began a uh, something called the Kroger Policy Review based upon the Kroger College. So that means that the PAPM program, as well as the sister programs such as Beacons, uh, they are working together to create this review on topics of international relations and public policy. And you really get to contribute what you genuinely care about. So you can become an editor, a writer, and I'm taking the position of a writer myself. So that was really amazing to see that come to, uh, come to light recently. Um, there's also so many other really interesting extracurriculars you can be a part of. So for example, there are advocacy groups that you can become familiar with. There are public speaking groups such as Molly UN, uh, the, the Moot team, you don't have to be in law if you wanna join that. And um, other organizations, especially there are uh, different organizations promoting um, feminist policy and uh, a woman's role or the ability for women to network amongst other people that care about international relations or other aspects of policy. And I'm really, really happy that PAPM has connected me with so many really amazing people that have given me these opportunities. Um, please ask me any questions you would like. I'm so happy to answer them. And I will pass it over to Stanley or Lisa. Thank you, Courtney, and uh, and thank you, Lisa, for that great intro. Um, so yeah, the, the questions are flowing, 
And I want to thank all of our attendees for, for asking these great questions and, and keep them coming. I got one question for you, Courtney, specifically. Uh, there's uh, someone who is interested in international relations and, and foreign policy, and they want to know what's your favorite part of the international policy specializations? What, what are you liking a lot about your specialization thus far? I'm really liking the course offerings. So, for example, um, some of my favorite profs from my first year are actually still teaching the courses in my third year and into my fourth year as well. So, uh, one of the classes I'm in right now is called Canada's Foreign Policies, and that gives a complete overview of Canada throughout the ages of becoming a country up until today. And you'll get to discuss so many different areas of uh, international policy. And for example, me caring about global health and feminist foreign policy, that's uh, I find it's frequently mentioned within my lectures, which feels really special to me. And of course, if you make a request to your professors to speak about something in particular you really care about, they will always accommodate this. So for example, if you are particularly very interested in global health as well, feel free to message your professors and ask what kind of connections they can make to the lecture in your interest. Um, as well as that, uh, this isn't necessarily the international policy, but PAPM in general. I'm really enjoying my PAPM 3000 course. And what it is, is that it is um, a course on research methods and creating your own research proposal, which can help you if you want to go into research postgrad, if you want to do your master's, your doctorate. And I'm able to write about the specific issues I care about. Um, did you know that international policy was going to be your, your specialization from day one, or was it kind of part of your discovery uh, as you started to learn more about the program? Definitely was part of my discovery. <laughs> um, it is totally okay if you need to switch your specialization if you're not sure what you want to go into first in the first place. So for example, me, I started out in social policy, and then I realized that I wasn't as interested in economics uh, as was required in that area. So I switched to a different stream and I am so, so happy in the international policy stream because um, I'm still able to look at my research interests. Awesome. So we're having a conversation with uh, Courtney, who is a student in the Public Affairs and Policy Management Program, and Lisa Mills, who is a program director. I'm going to bring Lisa back into uh, the live because there have been some questions uh, that have gotten uh, a few likes. And, and Lisa, you talked about this uh, earlier, which is co-op. And so uh, one of the questions we got was uh, regarding uh, the, the co-op partners that, um, that we have in PAPM. So maybe you can talk a bit more about um, where do our students go? Are there a lot of federal government opportunities as well? And and, and just how does co-op play out for, uh, for a PAPM student? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so co-op, most, most of our students um, get co-op employment in the federal government and co-op occurs uh, in the summer after, your first co-op can occur in the summer after your second year and uh, students get to work in, in co-op mostly in the federal government and I get to read the reports that students write at the end of their co-op semester and they seem to do really interesting things and, and have a, a, a great and interesting time and what they usually do in co-op is kind of um, yeah sort of a miniature version of what you would do as a policy analyst in the federal government where you would be um, doing research on policy issues um, you might be helping to create presentations about a policy issue um, you might be doing some research and writing notes towards uh, a note that would go to the minister to outline some of the issues around a particular policy and, and provide suggestions on that. Okay, Now you wouldn't be doing it by yourself at the co-op stage but you would be contributing in part of a team in the federal government uh, that would be working towards analyzing and providing advice um, on on policy issues. Uh, so most of most of the co-ops are with the federal government. Um, we do have a small number of co-ops every year um, that are with non-governmental organizations or at least in the summer we have a small number that are with government non-governmental organizations. So those are organizations like the Food Bank, um, World University Services of Canada, um, the uh, Institute of Planners of Canada. So those are organizations that are not government but that are still very concerned with 
public policy issues and where again you can do work with them uh, that would be helping with research, writing about policy issues, um, presentations uh, as well as administrative work as associated with those. And um, co-op I think it's an incredibly valuable experience um, and some students actually you know their co-op turns into um, part-time work even in during their degree while they're still in third and fourth year uh, or it might turn into full-time work after their after their degree as well so those are possibilities that arise from co-op We've got a student who asked about uh, law enforcement. They have their eye towards uh, a career in law enforcement and they want to know if there are any advantages of, of attending uh, Carleton for the patent program if that's their career pathway. Um, I think for your career pathway, uh, I think if you're interested in law enforcement, there's lots of lots of degrees that would be open to you. So you would be welcome and you would learn a great deal from Papam, but there would also be a number of degrees that for that for which that would be the case. But I think what would be good about Papam, uh, if that was what you're in, you were interested in, would be to learn about the broad context in which law enforcement occurs, um, to learn about the social structures in which it occurs, and to learn about how policy gets made, because part of what you would be doing um, would be working uh, within a particular context and, and enforcing laws that get, uh, that get made by governments um, in relation to certain kinds of pressures in society and in relation to certain kinds of structures in society. So what Papam would give you would be kind of the big picture of, okay, this is, um, if you're interested in, in law enforcement, these are how the laws that you're enforcing get made. Um, these are the kind of um, political pressures that you might your work might be subject to. These are the kind of social pressures that you might need to respond to. Um, this is the, the historical context that's led up to this moment. So I think for, you know, for many careers that are related to the public sector in a broad sense, having that knowledge and also having the skills to kind of think broadly and to be able to analyze and to understand the basis of the decisions that you're making. I think those are all really useful skills and knowledge to have for that area. There, there was a, a follow-up question to the uh, co-op question or conversation which was uh, and I know I don't know how um, precise you'll be able to answer this question but they want to know how um, often do students kind of flip their co-op uh, experience into a full-time job with the government immediately after they've uh, graduated from Papam? Yeah, I to be honest with you, I couldn't give you a definite figure on that. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I I can, I couldn't give you a definite figure on, on that, unfortunately. Um, but other than to say that it does happen <laughs> um, and what happens more frequently, I will admit, is um, part-time work during the degree um, and then perhaps uh, full-time work after that. But unfortunately, I can't give you a, a specific answer. Yeah, it's, it's hard to kind of tell exactly uh, what contributes or what leads to these opportunities students get once they graduate, but certainly, you know, doing co-op and getting that exposure and getting the networking opportunities won't hurt. You know, it'll definitely give these students a chance to to build their resume and, and hopefully build those connections that can also uh, provide some opportunities. So uh, we definitely say co-op is a is a good way to, to kind of get that exposure. So uh, we definitely encourage students to uh, to apply to co-op uh, whenever possible. Um, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to bring uh, Courtney back into the conversation because there were some questions that were uh, pretty specific that then you're going to want to uh, to dive into. So uh, Courtney, one question was about um, balancing your coursework and extracurricular activities. You know, so there's a student who really connected to your story about, you know, getting involved with Model UN and Mooning and wanted to know if, if, if it's possible, if it's feasible, if it's realistic to balance all of your interests with your, your schoolwork. That's a really great question and I'm very happy that that was asked. Um, you really have to be in tune with yourself during your university journey to understand if um, you feel yourself capable to be able to have a bunch of different extracurriculars, maybe a part-time job, a full-time studies. It's not for everyone. And for myself, um, 
Last year, I had to take a bit of time off school just so I could recover from a chronic illness that came about. Um, by the way, Miss Mills was very supportive during that time, so you can always reach out to your profs if you need uh, understanding. But I would say that um, what's helped me a lot, and again, what Miss Mills said, is that having a part-time job alongside your studies can definitely put your foot in the door and lead to a really great career after school. It's okay if you just want to focus on school as well. Um, there's no set path for everyone to take, but personally, I'm at my most comfort taking uh, less than five courses, understanding that it is okay if you don't finish your degree on time. Not many people do. Um, and it's okay if you want to work and become involved in extracurriculars and also do uh, your schoolwork at the same time, as long as you know how to balance it yourself. And in the context of the pandemic, I think it is especially interest or especially important to prioritize your health, mental and physical. So mm -hmm. do whatever works for you. Um, but again, for me personally, um, I have I am very proud of myself to be able to uh, to my part-time job, my full-time studies, my uh, my extracurriculars and understand that you can forgive yourself if you're not going to finish in five years. You could finish in 10 years. You know, everyone takes their own time and that's okay. So I think that I'm really glad I could mention that because that's something that's really important to me. That's right. Yeah, it's it really is a, a individual kind of experience in terms of kind of customizing and pacing yourself through uh, the university experience and, and wanting to do as much as you possibly can uh, while you are studying in your under, undergraduate degree. Uh, some students uh, like to have a variety of courses. Uh, others really love to focus in on one particular topic. Uh, with PAPLUM, the idea of, of electives isn't as prevalent uh, in uh, as, as in other areas. Has that impacted your experience, your academic experience, not having as many elective courses, but still getting uh, a lot of really cool content within PAPLUM? Uh -huh. Again, definitely, but I've experienced a bit of this with my university experience. For example, in my second year, I had uh, I was enrolled in a minor in French, and uh, I decided to remove my minor just because I wanted more flexibility with my electives. Um, if you're interested in taking a minor, that's really awesome, and it's totally possible to be able to fit that all in. Um, I personally wanted to explore some electives that were outside of my realm of interest. So for example, um, this semester I am taking a course on uh, global immigration policies, which I'm maybe I would have had room for, but it's not uh, within some of my normal research interests. So I'm finding that I'm learning a lot by kind of diving off into other areas. So I would say that um, it really depends uh, with your own experiences. Maybe your research interests are specific to a minor and you should be taking it if that will make you happy and make you have a really great university experience. Um, for me, it's just worked out to not take a minor, but I felt totally comfortable with the amount of electives I had, especially because as you reach your second, third, fourth year, you get to um, really specify what kind of courses you want to take and how they align with your interests. Awesome, awesome job. I love love your answers are really great. And uh, and I have a question that's gonna apply to both you and Lisa. So Courtney, I'll let you go first. Um, the question was about uh, what sets Carleton apart from other universities with similar programs. So I guess for you, it'd be more of, you know, what made you um, pick Carleton? Was Carleton always the number one in your heart? Was it uh, a longer journey to get to that point? What was it like, you know, selecting Carleton or at least selecting your program of choice when you were in high school? Uh, initially, I hadn't heard of the Papham program until a, a faculty member at my high school recommended it to me, understanding my interest. And ever since then, I was really won over. Uh, I think the program's ability to set you into your specific, like, okay, here's my Bachelor of Papham. I get to learn about it in my first year instead of most universities um, having to take a very universal general degree and then slowly filter your way into what you really want to do. Um, I think that PAPM worked really well for me and I, I really knew that I wanted to do it, especially again, the, the services at Carleton are really amazing. The, the program is really great. All of the courses really aligned with my interests. 
And also being in the nation's capital was a big selling point for me as well. And especially being able to work on and improve my French. Uh, I know like Carlton's been really great for that, taking a few French courses, uh, going to Quebec, um, you know, practicing at work. I think that was also a really big selling point for me. But I, it's really hard to talk about because I, I understand that some people may not know exactly what they want to go into and if this is the right program for them. But I identified that it was the right program for me and I've been happy ever since. Perfect. I love that. And and Lisa, I'm going to bring you back in. Uh, a similar question, uh, not necessarily uh, why did you uh, pick uh, Papam, but but more so uh, what makes it a, a special program uh, in Canada and, 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 and how do students kind of really uh, get a good grasp on what it is before they actually get here uh, in order to make the right decision for them? Yeah, um, I think what makes Papam a really great program is that if you're interested in current issues, if you're interested in um, working in public policy in some way, whether that's working for government, um, becoming a politician, um, going into law, working for an advocacy organization, if you're interested in any of those things, PAPM is great because you will have the opportunity to learn about policy issues and also sort of some of the, the technical and theoretical aspects of policy. Um, and you'll also get a whole lot of different interdisciplinary perspectives on policy. So you do courses in economics, in political science, in public administration, in history, um, in indigenous studies, uh, in social work um, and in international relations if like uh, if um, like Courtney, you're interested in, in international relations, you can do courses in that area. So you have this opportunity to get um, very different lenses on public policy programs and to under, on public policy problems and to understand them in different senses and different uh, aspects of the problem. Um, you also get the opportunity to um, to be in Ottawa and to have the advantages of being close to Parliament Hill. Uh, a lot of organisations have their um, head offices in Ottawa, so organisations that are lobbying the, the federal government, um, whether they be social justice organisations, business organisations, um, health organisations, they are located in Ottawa and so you have the opportunity to interact with those people and to do maybe do co-ops with them or work with them um, or hear from them as, as guest speakers and, and visit their organisations. Um, the other thing I think is, is really great about the program is, as I mentioned earlier, that it's a small cohort. So you really have a, a sense of collegiality, a sense of belonging to a particular program. Um, and we also have this really fantastic student organization called ACCESS. And ACCESS, you know, organizes not only great social events, which I think are really important, but also uh, ACCESS is, is pretty involved in community and uh, social issues. And they are, you know, people who are concerned about the world around them and try to contribute as well. We're getting some really great questions and, and we, we thank you all for, for sending those questions and keep them coming. These are uh, awesome conversation starters and uh, and there are some unique questions too. Like Lisa, there's a question about uh, your preferences. So what is your favorite course to teach? Okay, well, I will say that my favorite course to teach is um, the course that I'm teaching now, the first year course, Papa 1001. And I should say that my home department is uh, the School of Public Policy and Administration. And so I have taught uh, graduate students at the master's level and the PhD level, as well as students in the Papam program. Um, but my favorite teaching is in the Papam program because it's with undergraduates whom I really like teaching. And that Papam students tend to be really exceptional, that they tend to um, come in with 
being really engaged and really keen and have just fantastic questions. And whenever I get guest speakers coming into the class, uh, they always say, wow, those, you know, I would have expected those questions um, from students at a much higher level. Um, actually, last year in the, the class I was teaching, I had two people come in from Health Canada and they were talking about uh, the Canby case, which was actually um, there was a decision this year in the British Columbia Supreme Court. And the Canby case was about um, uh, a couple of doctors in British Columbia, one of them, Brian Day, um, who were contesting the constitutionality of British Columbia's health insurance law. And they were arguing that because people in British Columbia, as in many parts of Canada, um, have uh, have to are on the non waiting lists and they can't get to healthcare as, as quickly as they would like, um, that this violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, guarantee to uh, security of the person and uh, the right to life. And uh, so the two people from Health Canada came to class and were talking about um, the Canby case. They were explaining it to our students and talking about, you know, what Health Canada was actually doing about that issue and about that particular case. And um, uh, after the class, they said to me that, uh, well, I think they actually said in the class um, that they got better questions and comments from the Papin students than they had from uh, some of their workmates when they had presented, <laughs> sort of when they'd gone to other areas of Health Canada, they, they didn't get as much engagement and questions that were as challenging as they did from uh, the second year Papin class. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the Papam students I, I really enjoy working with uh, and it's great to be able to, to talk about things that are, you know, really pretty important that are going on in the world and to, to talk to young people about them. Uh, I think we live in a, you know, incredibly interesting and challenging time, which I suspect is going to get more interesting and challenging um, in that, you know, there are ma huge issues that we face related to, um, well, hopefully the pandemic itself will be waning with, you know, vaccines on the horizon, but there'll still be issues of recovery. Uh, there'll be issues of um, economic inequality, um, racial inequality, and the massive issue of climate change. I mean, these are all just huge things that all of us um, as individuals and as a society are going to have to address. And policymakers in particular are going to have to figure them out. And this is an education where you um, not so much have get the answers to how to deal with these things, but you get to grapple with them and to realize um, the, the, some of the context and the history behind them and how we got to this point and how to, to think about them in, in deeper and more sophisticated kinds of ways. There, there was an earlier question about uh, the international opportunities and I, and obviously right now we are dealing with uh, and still dealing with a, a global pandemic, but uh, under quote unquote normal kind of circumstances and times, um, how much of an international reach does this program have? Do students uh, take advantage of uh, some of the international opportunities that may present themselves? Yeah, um, now unlike the, the Biggins program, for example, we don't have a mandatory um, international experience requirement, but you could still um, go on international exchange or apply uh, for one of the international internships. So um, the international experience isn't confined just to begin students. You can still um, apply for the opportunity to, to work overseas or and a lot of our students do do international exchanges in their third year so they go to um, a, a university that Carlton has an agreement with and Carlton has agreements with universities in every continent um, on which there are universities so students can go to Africa, Asia, um, Australia, Europe, uh, and again, everybody student I've spoken to who has gone on international exchange has really enjoyed it and found that it's been an incredibly valuable experience. Um, 
so yeah, again, that's going to de- whether its availability in the future is going to depend on kind of what happens with COVID, but it's certainly something that students have taken advantage of in the past and that we would definitely support students doing again in the future as soon as it's possible. Uh, there's a question about um, about timing. Uh, when do students typically declare their specializations for uh, the program? Uh, that is um, at the end of their first year. So you don't have to know what you want to specialize in uh, in, you know, when you arrive. So you get to have the first year experience um, in which you will, you know, try out courses in history and economics and um, the public policy course and uh, Indigenous studies. And then you get to say, okay, at the end of your first year, all right, in second year, this is my area of specialization. Uh, So you don't have to decide before you get here. And if in first year you don't know what it is you want to do, don't worry about it. By the end, you will have an idea. And if it turns out that that you start a specialization and then you decide it's really not for you, that is by no means the end of the world. You can can change. so uh but you also have the opportunity in your first year to talk to people who've done um the different specializations you can talk to them about what they think the pros and cons of those specializations actually are and uh, then you can get to make up your mind from that we're getting to the uh the end of uh, tonight's event but before we wrap things up i want to give our awesome guests a chance to uh, share some words of wisdom and Lisa's giving me the wait a second. So go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I think I saw right at the beginning, Stanley, a question about what careers do people go into from Papam? Yeah, yeah, so for sure. I will, I'll just answer that. Um, so mostly uh, people do go into careers in, in government and that can be at the local level. So working in the city of Ottawa or the city of Toronto or, you know, whichever city in Canada that you might be interested in working with um, in provincial government is, is another option or the federal government. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of give you the some of the titles of um, jobs that some of our graduates have. Uh, so Um, One is Director of Communications uh, for the department that used to be the Status of Women and is now called Women and Gender Equality Canada. Um, Justine Villeneuve is the uh, Director of Communications for that department. Um, We have people who have worked in the Prime Minister's office. Um, We've had people um, work in, if you were in particularly the Communications Specialisation, people who've gone on to work in uh, public opinion polling, um, to work as assistants to MPs, uh, to run political campaigns. Um, The founder of uh, a public opinion firm, Abacus Data, is a graduate from the program. Um, People go into um, politics as well. So we have two, two of our graduates are federal MPs. Um, Three of our graduates work in uh, city councils. Um, One of the city councillors in Toronto, Joseph Cressy, is chair of the Toronto Board of Health and so has been really involved in um, uh, managing the COVID-19 pandemic in Toronto. Um, Think tanks. Uh, students go, you know, work for um, organizations that do research on public policy issues, um, for advocacy groups, environmental groups, um, community service groups. Um, a student that I supervised who was in the development specialization. Uh, After the program, she did an uh, MA at the London School of Economics, and then she actually got a job with the United Nations um, involved in the uh, peace negotiations in Colombia. And after that, she worked with the United Nations Mine Action organization, um, which was involved in trying to clear mines in the Middle East and in ISIS territory. So I think that was a pretty um, interesting job. 
Lots of people go on to law school and then become lawyers and in all areas of law. So they might then go go and work as Crown prosecutors or go work for government um, again as policy analysts, but on the more legal side or they work as in advocacy or for corporate law. Um, another student that I supervised um, went to law school and then became a corporate lawyer. Uh, what else? Um, so yeah, lots and lots of different paths. I will also say uh, that a stu student I supervised last year um, decided to take quite a different path and she wrote an honours research essay about midwifery and in the process of discovering that she decided what she really wanted to do with her life was become a midwife. And so I think one of the great things about our program is that it will give you the skills to uh, get a job or a career in public policy, in the public sector, um, in, in a leadership role, but also if you decide through the course of your degree that what the investigation of current issues has led you to is that you really want to do something different, you want to be a midwife, <laughs> that's fantastic too, that's what she's going to do. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so there's many, many different paths you can take from Papin. I love that. I love that, that, that you, you share that because there's there is kind of this idea that your your degree title should reflect your career aspirations. But a lot of times like students in programs like like public affairs, policy management are, are really just acquiring so many skills that can be used in a lot of different areas. So I thank you, Lisa, for, for sharing that story. And it also goes into a conversation we're having offline and I want to bring Courtney in to give her kind of uh, kind of last words of wisdom, but also to maybe share uh, where her head's at, where she's thinking she might head with her degree uh, once she graduates. And I know you've been kind of kind of thinking about this question already. So maybe you can share with the audience what you shared with us earlier uh, this afternoon. Yes, yeah, so we were speaking a little bit about this earlier, but I'm so happy to share this with you guys as well. Um, entering my degree into Carleton, I wasn't sure. I oops. Sorry, am I muted? Nope, you're good. Can you Okay, I had something come up at the top. Anyways, um, entering my degree at Carleton, I hadn't had any plans or any thoughts about what I wanted to do post-grad. I didn't even think I would be doing a post-grad, but I'm really thankful for all of the um, advisors and support around me to help kind of guide my interests. And I realized that I really want to go to law school and I really want to take the combined Juris Doctor and master's degree, not exactly sure where yet, and that's okay, but um, this is really a, a common path that I'm finding a lot of my colleagues taking as well, where they're considering law school. So uh, if you're also considering law school, you will definitely have a lot of LSAT study buddies, so no worries <laughs> there. <laughs> um, and, you know, of course, like Lisa was saying, you can take, you can go off the normal path as well. You know, you may be entering platform and think, okay, I want to take my MCAT after this, or I, you know, perhaps you don't want to do a, a postgraduate. That's all, all right. And it's so individual, the, the path you want to take with PAPM. Um, but yeah, so I'm personally really excited about working towards a master's and uh, law school. Uh, and as well as that, my, my fourth year path, I'm taking, opting into taking the honors research essay to be able to kind of guide my research interests, which will be so helpful in my post postgrad. Um, and some takeaway advice that I'd really like to share is definitely take advantage of the services at Carlton, the experiences. Um, you know, you can always look at the Student Experience Office website and see what they have available. Um, I was lucky to be a part of the uh, Kroger Policy Connect in my first year. I got to spend a day with the Student Alliance Policy Program, which was really interesting and I, I learned a lot. So that was really great to take advantage of. Um, extracurriculars are your best friend. <laughs> so again, this can be off campus, on campus. Um, I found myself becoming involved in advocacy groups and grassroots advocacy groups at that and making really meaningful connections with NGOs and members of parliaments who are you know, like-minded, they care about the same interests as you. Um, and as well as that, joining different public speaking groups, different groups that are again tailored to your interests, 
I joined a sorority, which I never thought I would do, but that's been so great for making really amazing friends. And you'll make some really great friends in the program as well. Again, it's a it's a tight knit community, and you really get to learn about each other and about each other's interests, and uh, really work together on different projects. Which again, I, I explained this a little bit earlier, is how um, the Kroger Policy Connect, or sorry, not the Kroger Policy Connect, the Kroger Policy Review came to life was a few passing colleagues working with a few vegan colleagues. And now we have this really amazing piece of work that we like are so happy to see other people join on board and be a part of this and really welcome the community all together. Um, but yeah, take advantage of the opportunities. You are going to school in the nation's capital. That's so cool. <laughs> Maybe you're like me and you just wanna to go to parliament every day and just sit and look at it. I'm a nerd. I'm a policy wonk. I'll say that. Um, but <laughs> but it's really amazing being at Carleton, and I have so much love for this program. So thank you so much for letting me speak on that today. No, thank you, Courtney. Your, the love for the program is certainly uh, being felt by I think everyone has listened to you speak. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, it's great. It's great to hear from our students as they um, express themselves. And Courtney, you did a great job of, of doing just that. So best of luck with um, whatever comes your way next and, and hopefully uh, continuing your, your pursuit of uh, an awesome degree and, and, and more um, as you uh, as you kind of come to the end of your undergraduate experience. And also thank you, Lisa Mills, uh, program director, for, for sharing some valuable words of wisdom, some valuable information, and some amazing insight to this really unique program that um, we have to offer. So I hope this uh, session was great for all of you in attendance uh, this evening. I want to thank you all for your amazing questions. We're going to stick around for about five minutes or so to uh, keep answering those questions that you're, you're still asking. And, and again, thank you for doing that. I also want to encourage you to join me on Instagram Live tomorrow at noon Eastern time. Uh, so that's 12 p.m. Eastern uh, for a conversation I'll be having with uh, two more Patham students. We have a lot of great students with a lot of great stories to share. So we're gonna have uh, that conversation on the Carlton underscore future Instagram live account. That's Carlton underscore future. And I'll post the, uh, the uh, Instagram account uh, very shortly. So I wanna, again, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you for your questions, your participation and your interest. Uh, in this uh, really amazing program. We hope your uh, holiday season goes really well. We hope you have a great start to your 2021, and we hope to see you at Carleton uh, in the fall. Take care.